Before the 1980s, home console video games weren't very popular. The games lacked quality and the hardware was often faulty. With arcade consoles being the dominant form of video games, the market crashed in the 1980s, only to be revitalized soon after with the release of the Nintendo Entertainment System, which gave players quality games and almost single-handedly popularized the home console and video entertainment. Soon after Nintendo made its debut, companies like Sega, Atari, and Coleco released consoles, adding more fuel to the fire of video game craze. The children who played games in the 1980s and 1990s grew up to become the next generation, and game after game, console after console, the video game crowd soon became a large part of modern society. Nowadays, video games are everywhere, advertised on television, streaming a walkthrough on YouTube, students discussing real-time strategy games during passing period, businessmen playing mobile games on their bus ride to work. Video games span multiple platforms, from arcade cabinets to iPhones. Competitive video gaming is as popular as sports. But with electronic entertainment such a widespread and common thing, how is it affecting this generation, and how is it affecting modern society and culture? Many people see games with adult content as a negative influence on the gamer. Many think that the inclusion of such content is bad, due to the large amount of younger gamers. Games have ratings, but that hasn't stopped many an underage gamer from playing mature titles. Many think that exposure will affect gamers negatively and sway them towards stuff like violence and alcohol. We interviewed local Portland video game developer Steven Gaynor of the Fulbright Company about his opinions and his experience as a video game developer. There's stuff that you, there are like themes that you can only address if you're going to have more adult content in a game, right? Like you can't talk about an extremely dangerous world or sexuality or like really intense conflict in a lot of cases if it isn't going to have something that has a certain age cutoff to it, you know? Um, but I think that there's a whole spectrum of really engaging games mechanically that either do or don't have certain kinds of content in them. I mean, like, it's something that's interesting because over the years, I feel like the technology has allowed more kinds of content to be revealed as well as expectations for what games can have in them changing. Um, but I think for the most part, it's broadened what games are doing as opposed to like changing them wholesale. You know, like we've still got Mario games that are really great. <laughs> and, uh, but also we have Grand Theft Auto games uh, that just talk about different stuff for a different audience, you know. Despite all the negative coverage, some vouch for the good side of video games. Studies have shown gamers display enhanced motor skills, spatial recognition, and quick decision making. Despite the limited popularity of educational games, there is much a gamer can learn from his or her experiences as a gamer. We've had a lot of high school and college classes um, get educational copies of the game and teach the game as a text in an English course. Like, they, you know, like, uh, like uh, uh, Catcher in the Rye and then Gone Home. Gone Home only has one thing to like about it pretty much right like it's a very focused game you explore and find the story in this place and that's like because you play a lot of games and you can be like well I didn't really like the story but the gameplay was cool you know or like eh, it was kind of not that exciting to do the first person shooting but I really like the story you know and, and with with Gone Home it's like you either like finding the story of this family or you don't the core of Gone Home is about the game not telling you what to do and the player being completely self-directed and saying, I'm going to go investigate this part of the room, I'm gonna read this note or pick up this object because I'm curious about it personally. And it was our job as the developers to like make, you know, give the player stuff to care about so they would be self-motivated to, to find more. Um, and it is based on being empathetic towards the, the characters that you discover and thinking of them as real people. Um, so I think that there are certain kind of ways that you have to approach the game to enjoy it. Um, and I think that something that's valuable about it is because we don't, as the designers say, go here next, now go here, now do this. 
it allows the game to be kind of a mirror of the person who's playing it. What I do is a direct result of you know a lot of media that I've consumed over the, the course of my life. Um, and so obviously that's changed me as a person, but that's music, movies, games, books, television, you know, it, it all kind of is the media landscape that you inhabit. Many argue about the effects that video games have. I mean, I think that, like, done well, it's that any media can influence how someone thinks about the world around them. <laughs> Can video games make you smarter? Find out next! Please keep watching. <laughs> video game addiction is a very widespread and common problem with many people. I'm not very professional. Currently I've been playing a lot of Tetris. Now Tetris is a very simple game, but it's very, very complicated because it's shapes, just shapes. So, uh, were you ever like a big child gamer? <laughs> yes, I was a big child gamer. Action! Sometimes. <laughs> You're an actor. Still in action. I like trains. What's your favorite thing about trains? I like trains. <laughs> we can so totally put this on the bloopers. Thank you.